And, and it's uh, it just saddens me to see what you know what uh, mainstream nutrition and, and I was part of the problem myself. So um, you know, uh, tell me from your perspective, how was your journey to uh, to uh, to coming out on you know to where you are today? Well, I was a pretty conventional dietitian. I, I became a dietitian in 2008, and for the first probably three years, I recommended a low-fat diet, you know, plenty of whole grains, very balanced, and I thought, and I ate this way as well, and I just thought if everyone followed what I said and ate the way I did, we'd all just be wonderful, and I, I really... Um, I really thought that was the way to do it, but I found in 2011 that my blood sugar was actually going up quite a bit after meals. My fasting blood sugar was always normal, mm -hmm. but after meals, my blood sugar was going up into diabetes levels, mm -hmm. and I discovered this because I had some uh, life insurance labs done, and they showed my A1C was actually right below the pre-diabetes level, and that Ooh. concerned me as a I was studying for my certification in diabetes education at the time. Yeah. So uh, I started testing my blood sugar and my very healthy, balanced, low-fat diet was causing these very elevated blood sugar levels. So I started experimenting with cutting back on carbs a bit. My blood sugars were still not well controlled until I got down to a pretty low carb intake. And I started doing research online to see how people with diabetes manage their blood sugar. And I found that those who were following some form of carbohydrate restriction had the best control, best A1Cs, took the less medication. And, uh, and I, I just said, hey, this is actually what we should be doing. People with diabetes obviously have a carb intolerance. When they eat the carbohydrates, their blood sugars go up. And yes. yet we're telling them, eat a low-fat diet, and a low-fat diet is, by definition, a higher-carb diet. There's only so much protein you can have. So if you're sure. keeping the, the fat very low, the carbohydrates are going to be high. So, yeah, and, and that just, it really started inspiring me to hear so many success stories from people with diabetes and seeing my own numbers. And uh, I started my blog, Low Carb Dietitian, and, and it just everything kind of progressed from there. Wow, that's uh, that's fantastic. You know, I had a I had myself a um, a similar thing that happened. I was actually uh, had started uh, being a guinea pig for a bunch of experiments back in when I was in university and I was doing a health science degree and and I actually learned more from being in the lab, being a guinea pig with all these doctoral students and post and postdoctoral students than I did you know in all the classes and. Uh, Anyway, so I was going in at least once a week, and uh, they were doing all kinds of, you know, of uh, blood tests and uh, lactic acid and with exercise and environmental chambers and all kinds of weird stuff. And uh, and I was told a number of times, hey, you need to watch your, uh, you know, watch your watch your blood sugar levels because you're showing signs of prediabetes. I was like, wow, well, you know. <laughs> Hey, I've always been healthy. I'm eating this, you know, perfect high carb, low fat diet where, you know, I don't eat any sugar, you know, no sugar. And I couldn't understand it. I thought, you know, these guys are crazy. And then little by little, I started thinking, well, you know, if carbs, uh, as you noticed, uh, or as you thought sort of uh, people are starting to wake up, it's so simple when you see it, right? It's like, well, you know, your body doesn't tolerate that many carbs, you know? Yes. And, and I've seen it, you know, especially in women. I'm I'm 48 now, so I'm getting to that age where hormones are shifting, and and really, the older you get and the more insulin resistance you get, the less you can tolerate carbohydrates. Unless you're extremely active or you're just blessed with a, a metabolism and a, a a way to process carbs that most people are not. Most people don't continue to eat that way or can't continue to eat that way throughout their lifetime. Yeah, that's a great point. So you, so you would, you've also noticed, you, you see as well with yourself, as well as with, probably with others, that as we get older, we, we tend to tolerate less carbs. So, uh, yeah, that's um, that's a great point. Wow. Well, let's let's talk about some of your, um, you know, in your day to day practice. Are you working with uh, with coaching clients, or do you work in an in, or in a in a clinical setting? How was your how was your average day? Okay. Um, up until the end of 2013, I worked in a large veterans hospital in the outpatient clinic. And the reason I left is because 
my low carb recommendations really, I couldn't put them into practice there. It was right. a, a federal facility and we're really bound by the USDA guidelines. Right. So I left and it's been exactly a year now that I've been practicing on my own. Uh, I, I do have an office, but I do a lot of my coaching and consulting and counseling via Skype or phone because I, I, I can see people all over the country that way, which is yeah. wonderful. But I have some local clients as well. I have one really great doctor who believes in low-carb and a whole foods approach. That's one thing I didn't mention. It's whole foods low-carb. It's not low-carb with lots of processed low-carb bars and shakes. I don't believe in that. I believe in whole foods. And this yes. doctor supports that. So she sends clients to me. So And then um, just by word of mouth, my, my practice has grown. So I, that's my practice is low-carb dietitian. I do nothing really but work with people with diabetes, weight issues, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and, uh, and, and that, you know. And most of my clients, I would say, are women. And I think I have some men, and they do very well, but uh, I think women kind of relate to other women, and especially women around my age. We understand kind of the, the, the hormonal issues that are going yes. on, and, and low-carb can be very helpful with that. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. Hey, let's talk about that a little bit. I, I deal more with men, probably about 60-40, um, mm -hmm. and uh, with, with women, um, it's, it certainly is, a, is an issue, and there's different, you know, obviously, as we know, there's differences in the, in the hormonal system and in responses. So from your, uh, how, does, how do you, uh, how would you work with a, with a typical woman who might come to you with, you know, let's say she's in her mid-40s, and uh, uh, what would be some typ a typical case scenario? Okay, so everyone's different, of course, but uh, I would say... A typical client for me would be somebody who has noticed weight gain, maybe some blood sugar issues or sleeping issues even happening in her 40s. And will I'll do like a full assessment of what they're eating now, what kind of diets they've tried in the past and that sort of thing. Yeah. And we find and individualize a plan that works for them. It'll always be carbohydrate restricted, but the amount of carbohydrates can vary greatly. Some people do well on a very, very low carbohydrate plan and others can eat up to you know, about 100 grams of carb a day and still do well, lose weight. Depends how active they are. And as I said before, you know, just their own like genetic predisposition to carbs. So um, I, I individualize it, but in general, it's going to be recommending a lot of vegetables. And, and that's the thing is low carb. It, it can mean, you know, low carb could be that you eat nothing but bacon, eggs, and steak all the time. That's a low carb diet. But what I recommend is definitely having plenty of plant foods as well, uh, vegetables, berries if tolerated, nuts if tolerated, some dairy, and cocoa. Cocoa is actually great. People don't think of it as being a health food, but it really is as long as there's no sugar. Use unsweetened cocoa powder and you're getting phytochemicals and fiber and deliciousness so oh, yeah, delicious. <laughs> cocoa is something I recommend unless someone can't tolerate it that's why I personalize things They're, everyone has their own unique uh, system and some people tolerate and do well with certain foods and, and others don't so we just need to investigate that and, uh, and, and that's what I do and I actually just wrote a book about it's specifically for women called the low carb dietitian's guide to health and beauty where I Make it as broad as possible for the reading audience, but also explain how things really do need to be tailored to the individual to, to optimize your health. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Is that, um, now when did your book come out? Was that last year or? No, it just came out on Monday, actually. Oh my gosh, I'm, so, I, missed, I missed the note. I'm sure that's Rachel you know has. Why, because Honestly, when we booked this interview, I had no idea when my book was going to come out. It's self-published, so I didn't have a, uh, like a, a firm date. And right. it was the way that I found it had actually appeared online was that somebody tweeted it on Twitter saying, I just bought your book. And I said, oh, okay, they, it's out. So it, it's just been kind of a funny week for me. But, yeah, it's available. <laughs> hey, wow. Well, congratulations. Well, and, you know, for you. both going, you know, first for, for leaving behind the institutional shackles that were, uh, you know, forcing you to be sort of subjugated to the to the FDA's flawed, um, you know, heavily flawed and uh, recommendations, and uh, and also for for doing your book. I know I've, that's uh, that's a big big effort. So good for you. 
Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> so for, for people out there that are, and I think in our audience, we'll have both, typically both, you know, health professionals as, as well as, you know, people in the general public who are just into this or want to get into this. Um, what would, could you give us maybe uh, two or three takeaways, um, anything that, uh, that you've, that maybe would be, uh, you know, interesting to people that would maybe pique their curiosity to get your book? Oh, okay, certainly. As I said, it's specifically for women. So I address, uh, you know, when women go on a diet with their husband, usually, he'll lose 10 pounds the first week, and she may lose a pound or two, and then kind of plateau. He can eat a lot more than she can. I'm just, I'm letting women know it's okay. This is just part of being women. We have a lot of advantages, I think, of being women, but we also, in, in the weight loss department, we're, we're kind of at a disadvantage compared with our husbands. So don't yes. compare yourself to him. And, and uh, also, uh, I, I provide a lot of guidance in choosing the amount of protein and and the types of fat to eat, and also getting the good healthy carbohydrates in there. I'm a big believer in having vegetables at every meal, and I have, I think I've included 41 recipes and three meal plans with sample meals for the week. There's a little quiz to see which plan would be best for you, but if you take the quiz and you don't like the answers that you get, you know, you don't get, you don't like the plan that you end up with, it's okay. You can rotate between plans. It's not Okay, you, you got mostly two, so you have to do this diet. It's not like that. It's, it's very flexible. And, uh, and I also talk about low-carb beauty foods, how certain low-carb foods actually can improve our looks because of the compounds they contain and wow. the way hey, they affect the blood sugar. Let's go into that. Tell us about you know, yeah. your top – what are the top, uh, the top three low-carb beauty foods? Beauty foods. Okay, number one, fatty fish. Fatty fish like salmon, sardines, herring, uh, they contain the omega-3 fatty acids and those reduce inflammation, so they help to protect your skin from wrinkling. Cocoa, I already talked about oh, that, yeah. but one of the compounds in cocoa can actually protect your skin from sun damage, just like a sunscreen. It's amazing. You're eating it, but it's actually making your skin more resistant to sun damage. So that's another one, cocoa. Yeah. And um, what else is on there? Avocado. Avocado, excellent source of potassium and fiber, as we know, and healthy fats. But there is evidence that it can also keep your skin smoother and just a better overall appearance to it. So by eating these healthy whole foods that are still low in carbs, you are gaining benefits to both your inside and your outside. You're getting healthier. You're looking healthier, feeling better. So, yeah, those would be the top three, but I actually have ten. So, to, to learn the others, you'll I guess you'll just have to buy the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's on Amazon. I would I would imagine it's on Amazon. Yes, Amazon.com. If you just type in my name, or if you go to my website, I have a book link there too. Right. Yeah. Fantastic, Francisca. So uh, let's let's talk about um, you know more in a bit more general sense. Uh, what are the t maybe the the top uh, the top myths or or problems that you see people you know, as far as people are so confused out, you know, and there's so much misinformation. But from your perspective, what are the, if you, if you could pick three things that are, you know, the pitfalls or the stumbling blocks for most people, what might that be? Okay, I would say one of the number one things now is that people, it's, it's, in a way it's very good. People are no longer afraid of fat, which is great. Fat should make up the largest component of your diet calorie-wise. However, it doesn't mean you should be slathering all of your food and fat if you want to maintain a healthy weight as a woman. Adding additional fat to your diet isn't going to make it more likely that you lose weight. You want to have a healthy amount of fat, but if you're not losing, to increase the amount of fat is not going to make you burn more fat. It's actually going to make you burn less because you'll need less. Yeah. <laughs> you're eating it instead of using your own fat from your body. So I would say, you know, be careful with the fat. Still want to have plenty, but choose good sources and definitely don't overdo it on the fat. Um, another one is just know that it's going to take a while to get used to eating this way. And it's okay if you aren't perfect every single day. Because I think that's what gets people off track too, is they have one day of going off and they say, oh, this is too hard to stick to. I just can't do it. Forget it. 
but it does take a little while. Some people adapt quickly and other people it's a struggle, but after you've been doing it for a while, you just kind of settle into this way of eating and you feel so good and you're so uh, usually so happy with the results that you're not tempted to go off. And if you do go off for one day for your birthday or a celebration, it's okay the next morning. It's, it is just as easy as any other diet to get back on the, the wagon afterwards. Yeah. And finally, another myth, um, I would say that it's not sustainable. This is, the, this is what I hear a lot from maybe other dietitians or people that are involved in, uh, in the diet industry, that low-carb diets are great for quick weight loss, but they're not sustainable. And you know, after having done it for four years and seeing people who have done it for longer than that, um, I just disagree. I think it can be a very healthy, sustainable way to eat long term, as long as you make sure you're including the whole foods, and plenty of vegetables and and plant foods, as well as the animal foods. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a great point. I, you know, I what I've, I am seeing is some of the um, uh, one thing is people are are forgetting that whole part about the, the whole foods and the vegetables, and so they're uh, going to the. I had a a, a well, it's a, it's a friend of our family's actually who sent me a, a a picture at the Denny's buffet, and he said, "Oh, yeah. you know, I heard that you you said it was okay to to eat high fat, and that that's the way you know to go." And so uh, he was just loading up on uh, on all the uh, you know this very uh, you know terrible terrible looking sausages and you know low quality uh, and so can you speak to us about food selection how do you uh, for people that you know that are that need want that want to do the right thing what talk to us about uh, you know a couple of tips about selecting the right food and food quality sure so in general you want to select the least processed foods and whenever possible, choose organic or pasture-raised. And I don't know how it is in Spain, but in many areas in Europe, the food is just naturally raised well. You don't have the factory farming issues that we have in the States. Right. Um, most of our food here is uh, factory farmed. If you can afford to do organic, to do that. Have like the sausages you were talking about. That's a processed food. It's, um, you know, it's, it's got some questionable ingredients. It's not going to support your health nearly as much as having, you know, meat that's just slow roasted or, or cooked in another way than uh, the sausage that's been processed and um, has nitrates and, and other things added to it. Right, so I would say MSG. try to choose food as close to the way it came naturally as possible. And, you know, if, if there's no other choice for breakfast, if it's a choice between sausages and pancakes, of course, you choose sausage. But whenever possible, you want to try to choose a more natural method of cooking. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So, yeah, food quality is, uh, is a key issue. And uh, um, for, uh, for people who are, um, you know, and they, of course, there are people out there that are really on a budget and they, they want to do well, but they can't afford organic uh, what would you suggest for you know healthy eating on a budget? Any tips for people? Yes, yes. The great thing about uh, canned fish, like canned salmon, that's very very inexpensive. But all of the canned salmon is wild caught; it's not farmed. Oh, I didn't so know it's got high that. omega three fatty acids. Oh yeah, I do canned fish and canned sardines. Same thing. Um, I do that a few times a week. And I just like them. They're so easy, and you don't have to cook the fish. But they're they're uh, they're an extremely healthy, economical way to get those fatty acids in and high quality protein too. Yeah. Eggs uh, eggs are very inexpensive, even if you uh, even if you get the non organic kind. They're still so healthy. So eggs are wonderful on a budget, and you know just really looking in the supermarket too to see what's on sale you'd be amazed um, some people just kind of head for the same places every time but try something new that's on sale you know um, also organ meats are good and I say this is more of a do as I say not as I do thing because I haven't been doing them but they're generally not that expensive but they're extremely healthy so that's one of my kind of New Year's resolutions is to explore organ meats a little bit more yeah. um, uh, yeah, those those would be a few tips, and um, you know, just purchase the amount that you need so that you're not 
you know, you never have to throw anything out. That breaks my heart more than anything is to see people throwing out food because they're, they're not using it up. So, um, you know, just it, it, it takes a little organization, but making sure that you're buying the right quantity for the amount that you need. Yeah, yeah, great tips. I love that. So, yeah, so canned fish, um, canned yes. fish, eggs, and then eggs. Get, and then the getting the right quantity so you're not getting too much perhaps is a good one. Exactly. Um, hey, I've got, I've got a related tip because I, I found one of the things uh, that was happening with a lot of our, our coaching clients was they would, you know, they would go shopping and they would take our, you know, take the recommend, recommendations and they'd buy a bunch of healthy food. And then they'd get home and they would say, well, you know, I don't know where to put all this. You know, I mean, it sounds like a no brainer, right? So I've, we we missed the, we missed the boat which before we before going to shop. We now actually say, hey, look. Step one is to clean out the kitchen, get rid of all the junk, get rid of the you know the yeah. processed foods, and make space for make space physically, and then also make space in your appetite because you know there is some food you know some some food addiction issues for some people as well as just being you know we get habituated to certain certain you know grabbing the grabbing the uh, the can of or or the the jar of uh of whatever it might be or or the pasta or this that or the other so that's been helpful for a lot of people uh and also so right. if you don't have another you don't have something else sitting you know in your cupboard that you shouldn't eat then you have to eat the healthy stuff, you know, to get through the first few weeks. Yes, keep the bad stuff out. Yeah, keep the bad stuff out of the house so it's not a temptation. Yeah. So, hey, let's talk about that for um, a similar thing, food cravings. Um, sometimes people say, oh, you know, I, I tried to – I got I did two days of healthy eating, and then I had all these food cravings. So uh, any, any tips for, for dealing with food cravings? Yeah, so food cravings are, are a tough one, and for some people, it helps to have a food, a low-carb version of the food that they're craving, and for others, it can kind of set them off. I'm thinking mostly now about cravings for sweets. Yes. So for people who want, you know, they're, they're craving chocolate cake, there are, you know, thousands of low-carb chocolate cake or brownie recipes online that you can find. Um, for some people, they do the trick. For other people, it just causes them to kind of overindulge in these cravings. So I think you need to learn what kind of an eater you are and how those affect you. If really you, you know that the minute you take a bite of anything sweet, whether it's sweetened with sugar or a sugar substitute, that it triggers cravings in your brain for more, then I would say you just you really need to go cold turkey like you would on uh, with alcohol or drugs or anything like that. If those actually make it easier for you to stick to the plan because they are substituting for the higher carb, higher sugar food, then I think they can be beneficial and help to kind of assuage your cravings. So it really depends on the person. And um, again, it's a process usually once you start low carb, getting used to eating this way and, and waiting for those cravings to, to abate. Yeah, so, you know that that gets back to the to one of the things so Socrates uh, was, was one of my favorite people, and uh, although I, I know just a, a few things that uh, stand out, and his one of his big things was know yourself. So I think what you're saying is that I think that's such a key for everything, whether we want to improve our nutrition or our fitness or our business or our, you know our family life, whatever. No, you know that's a great point. Knowing yourself and. Uh, I've, I've had that I, today. I had a uh, on Facebook. Uh, someone had sent me a, uh, a a new study showing that uh, you know again showing beneficial aspects of red wine consumption, and uh, so I shared that. But at the same time, I then had second thoughts and went back and sort of put a, a caveat in because my experience also. I've done some work with with folks who were dealing with addictions as well. And that is you do have to know if you have the addictive personality or not because some people can deal with – some people can have a, a glass of wine or can have that chocolate cake once a week and they can turn it off and they can uh, – you know, or right. whatever. So Yes. Yes. It's, it's, each person is different. I mean, you have to find out what works best for you. So Socrates is right. Yeah, no question. No question. So, you know, that's a let's, – let's slide – let's talk about uh, um, as far as – you know, with alcohol consumption, um, any recommendations for people that for people that can, you know, limit themselves? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, what would be the the worst? You know, the 
uh, worst alcohol and the best alcoholic choices? Okay. The worst alcoholic choice is a mixed drink like a strawberry margarita because you've got all the sugar, <laughs> any of the mixtures that contain sugar or lots of fruit juice. Uh, yes. You know, some of the really delicious tasting ones, at least to me, I'm not much of a drinker, so um, those would be the most delicious ones for me, but uh, definitely the ones to stay away from on a low-carb diet. Uh, dry wine is good, red wine, uh, white wine, they only have a gram or two of carbohydrate. If you get into a sweeter wine, you're going to have more carbs. Oh, yeah. And straight alcohol, just, uh, you know, whiskey or vodka or bourbon Zero grams of carbohydrate, which is great. But if you have diabetes, it can still affect your blood sugar, even though there's no carbs. So if you have a lot with a meal, it can tend to increase your blood sugar. If you have you know, more than a shot or two by itself, it can actually decrease your blood sugar dangerously. I always recommend people to drink with food rather than on an empty stomach, just because of the unpredictability of blood sugars, especially for people with diabetes, whether or not they're on medication. So that would be a good choice if you can, you know, mix with either drink it by itself or mix with a non-caloric mixer. And uh, light beer still has about six or seven grams of carb, but if you love beer, having one beer I think would be okay as well. Light beer. Yeah, that's a great point. It's a great point. Wow, this is this has been so fun. This is the time is <laughs> flying by, and I want to be respectful of your of your time and. Uh, and I think we should we should we should have you back on the show in the future because there's there's so many cool things. We want to hear, find out how your book is doing, and uh, um, so let's let, if we could wrap it up. Maybe if there's any any other you know any other thing tip that you could give people out there, simple, powerful uh, ideas that that maybe we didn't have time to cover. We've covered oh, a lot. This is a great interview. We've covered a lot, I think. No, really, uh, the thing I want people to take away is you really got to personalize uh, you know, the way that you eat to something you can do long term. So in term, whether you're doing low carb or not, make sure that it's well balanced, but also something, make, it sure, make sure that you like to eat this way because you're going to be doing it for a long, long time. And, and that way you can support your health. So eat the things you like, make sure it's balanced. And, uh, and as you said, just know yourself and, and treat yourself well. This is your body. You only get one. You don't get to trade it in. So do the best you can with what you have. Great point. Francisca Spritzler, uh, yes. thank you so much. Um, now, for people who want, to, who want to find you, might want to reach out and check out you know, your material, maybe do some work with you, uh, especially women out there, uh, what's the best place to find you online? Okay, so my, my website is Low Carb Dietitian, so that's www.lowcarbdietitian.com, okay. and my contact form is on there, my Twitter, Facebook, um, Google+, Pinterest, they're all on there too if you want to follow me on any of those social media. Excellent, excellent. We'll look you up on, well, we're, I think we're connected on Twitter, and uh, maybe we'll, we, ha we haven't done as much with our Facebook, but we'll, we're going to look you up on Facebook and... Uh, okay. Try to get that going, and if we can ever do anything for you in you know in Spain or in Europe, or or if you're ever coming this way, do uh, let us know, and be great to uh, to uh, to stay in touch. Uh, we're going to be doing a comp.